Gary McAllister, in my view, is the epitome of what the English Premier League doesn't have enough of. A guy with fabulous control of the ball who reads the game, sees spaces, but uses his feet to put the ball exactly where it should go, exactly where a teammate needs it. We often say, how much would such and such a player be worth in the modern market? Well, with Gary, I think you name your price, you name your figure. Fantastic, elegant, technical, gifted, visionary footballer. He arrived at our Leeds Hotel um, for this big interview, looking like a million dollars. I can tell you that for sure. And then, metaphorically at least, by the end of the interview, his words were worth that much too. I didn't really expect the Vinnie Jones love-in. I knew that Gary was the man who put Pep Guardiola's European career at Barcelona to a painful end uh, with a 1-0 victory at Anfield over Barcelona. There are great words as we go about his traditional playing partners in the Leeds midfield that won the title, Gary Speed, David Batty. But good stories, good explanations about Cantona, his arrival, his impact. And Billy Bremner, if you grew up as a Scot or as a Leeds fan, Billy Bremner was a very important character. And the story about him in his loafers and his sheepskin coat and his beautiful London West End tailored suit playing in the mud of Leeds' training ground, it's a dancer. It's perfect. He thought it was a wind-up when he was asked to sign for Liverpool. When he did sign for the Reds, he wound everybody else up, ending in glory, sadness for him in the FA Cup final, but a magnificent part in one of the most exciting UEFA Cup finals there's ever been. Oh, and by the way, I didn't expect the sex toy. This is out of equilibrium because it's going to be far more pleasant for me than it is for you, and I know that from experience, because, Gary, you, you've always been able to talk as interestingly and intelligently and elegantly about football as you were able to play it. Now, it's not final because you're going to go and improve that over the next hour. But I've always thought, or certainly it's intrigued me, I grew up, what I mean, mad about Aberdeen, which I still am, even madder as, as I get older and stupider, because of Eddie Gray, mostly, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. To a lesser extent, Joe and, and Billy Bremner and Harvey and, and I, I like Leeds. Yeah. <laughs> At a time, I felt like the only person outside Leeds in those days who liked yeah. Leeds because they... And I don't know if it's because Leeds' triumphs in Don Revy's day were resented. I've always felt your league title, mm -hmm. and let's underline that, you worked in a Leeds team that was champions of England. I've never felt that there's as much affection and reminiscence about a damn good team, something like a damn good midfield. Do you think I'm onto something there that maybe it's I, slightly underappreciated? No, I absolutely agree with you 100%. You know, I don't think Howard Wilkinson has ever got the acclaim that he should. He was the last English manager to win it. Mm -hmm. You know, and the way he put it together, the way he got himself out of the old second division, he got Vinnie Jones in, Chris Kamara, they come in, did a job, but instantly realised how great a job they did to get the club back into the top league for the first time and I think there was eight or nine years of absence away that things needed to change they needed a different type of player to then carry on a threat into the top division and that was pretty clear he made that pretty clear you know he says you're coming here and you'll probably replace Vinny who's been brilliant to me and if you can equal what he did you'll, you'll done a great job and, and that was a drive and, and, and the first person that welcomed me here you know not a million miles away from where we're sat right now mm -hmm. was Vinny Jones Ah. And he knew I was brought in to replace him. But it tells you a little bit something different about the guy. You know, he was, he was a humble fella. And he sent a car to pick me up and he showed me the city in one failed swoop, you know, which ended up maybe in a late bar that evening. But he was, that's the type of guy Vinny was. It was a realisation that his type of player was, was needed to get Leeds out of the old second division. But then there was going to be a wee change on how Leeds were going to approach you know, attacking the old first division. See, intelligent though I've branded you, I, I would have thought that for a footballer, footballer like mm -hmm. you, to be told by even a manager you respect, well, I'd like to equal Vinnie Jones. I know players of your calibre who'd have gone, well, we're off to a bad start manager. Well, now I know why you weren't, but some might have just gently but, gone. But there, you know, the thing is, it's about people and how you influence games. Vinnie Jones in the second division influenced games. Yeah, he rallied a great crowd. The crowd here has always been second to none. Yeah. The Ellen Road crowd is, is special. But he brought everybody together. Don't forget, Strachan was to the right-hand side of him as well. He was there purely to stoke and get into the, other, the opposition mm -hmm. 
to make sure that Leeds couldn't be bullied, you know, and, and, and then get the ball to the likes of a young, there was young Batties and young Speed and, and Strachan who, he made a massive move from Manchester United to drop a division and come in and influence. And, and again, Strack was part of a, an ongoing thing where small Scottish midfielders really affected Leeds United. Bobby Collins in the 50s, 60s, and then Billy, of course, Billy Bremner after him, and then Gordon. So it's been amazing how mm -hmm. three sort of five foot four, five foot five ginger haired midfielders have affected this club. Would you have been affected? by the fact that Gordon was already there. How well did you know Gordon? Uh, clearly, I suppose Leeds coming up, Howard, a man of integrity and, and a guy with a reputation, that might have tempted you anyway mm. before anybody ever talked about salaries or anything like that. But would playing next to Gordon have been something that went as a balance in your mind or was it a completely new experience? No, Gordon was massively influential in my decision making to come to Leeds United. I'd, bearing in mind the night before I signed for Leeds United, I was in a hotel bar nearly signing for Brian Clough in Nottingham Forest. So my mind was made up to go, if I wanted to play for Brian Clough, but, mm. but Brian was at that stage in his life where things were just starting to drop away and I'd missed the great Brian Clough, unfortunately, and things deteriorated in that meeting. You could judge that? I could judge that. I could feel that. My agent could feel it. When we looked at the room, there was Alan Hill and Ron Fenton and they could feel it as well. Hindsight, you know, and time to reflect yeah. now, I look back and I'd, I'd love to have played for Brian Clough and his pomp. You know what he achieved at Forest was unbelievable, but that didn't happen. So Leeds came in, and Strachan was a big part of my decision. I'd obviously played against them the previous season with Leicester City in the old second division. I had a good record against Leeds, and I thought obviously that's where I've caught Howard's eye. And it was there was a one of Jock Wallace's staff at Leicester City, Ian McFarlane, yeah. had moved to Leeds United under Howard, and he was obviously he was a Belsall boy and a Lanarkshire boy. He was pushing my name into Howard Wilkinson. So there was a few wee things that were saying this this could be the right. And as soon as I met Howard and met the chief executive, I could feel there was momentum here in Leeds. They'd come up out of the second division, as I said, nine years of absence, one club city. I just felt right, you know, and, and, and I signed. I think I may be older than you, but, but the long and short is, we might have similar memories of a powerful Leeds. Mm -hmm. when, when you were young, was it Billy, was it Eddie? Well, do, or, do, do, or what? You say you've got this sort of fondness for, for Leeds United. Particularly what, Eddie. You know, the, the thing is, the, the, the big Scottish connection, you know, the, you know, Lorimer, Jordan, McQueen, you know, Arthur Graham, you know, there's, there's so many. You know, the thing is, the inspiration that I took for that was, whenever I played, I always felt they were watching and I was representing them. You know, it was a, so the Scottish thing came yeah. out. Yeah. And to try and emulate what they did, as you said, they were a team that was they were playing at a different level than most at that particular time, and they were fantastic, and, yeah. and and should have done better. You know, they should have won more. They probably didn't get the record. Right, you know, they were sort of robbed in a European final. We well, were made to play four or five games in seven days, I think, at the end of one season, which and, lost. And the referee the has proved to have been bent and against and, Bayern Munich. So it's now convicted. So as much as they were successful, they were better than what they actually achieved. And, and you yeah. speak to all of them, they all agree. You know, Giles, Bremner, oh. Lorimer, Gray, as you say, Frank Gray, Hunter. It's, they could play and mix it. Yeah, it's they just were, that they maybe sometimes mixed it too much and Chelsea took it to them. And there was a series of Chelsea Leeds games, but those two games, those cup finals, yeah. they weren't football well, as we know you, it. You, and, uh, yeah, I know, but as much as you look at the skill involved and their ability to keep possession of the football, which is a big thing in modern yeah. day football, they were brilliant. Yeah. On pitches, there wasn't a blade of grass. No. They were a special team, you know, and, and once you got to know all of them, mm -hmm. what Don Revy created was unbelievable. They were, to this day, you know, and there's obviously, we've lost a few of them, but they're so tight. Mm -hmm. well, you know, the Alan Clarks, the, you know, whenever you see them and you go to a game, at Allen, they are so close knit, you can really understand why they were successful, and that's what we tried to get with, with Gordon and Howard. There was a couple of, because it was Mick Jones up front, off quite mm. often with Alan. Yeah, and Alan Clark, yeah. And, and Rini and Maidley, and I often felt that... One Terry them, Cooper left back, you know. And they, some of them could actually play even more than they've been credited for, because I think we all knew, no matter what Leeds' reputation then was, that Lorimer had it. Lorimer maybe had something that you equalled and, and surpassed yeah. it. He was a lovely passer, and Billy was a fantastic captain. Eddie, Eddie was divine. For me, I fell in love with people you, who could... It's amazing, you mentioned four or five, but then you speak to that four or five, uh -huh. and there was one gaffer to a man, the lost. Giles was the... Johnny. He was, yeah. the, he was the main man. Yeah. You know, you've you seen the clenched fists of Billy and, 
you know, and him, the tigerish, the red hair, and everybody assumed that he was the natural leader. He was the scorer of a very, very important goals, you know, great goals at Hamden against Celtic. You know, he came up with the big goals in the cup finals. But it was Giles, it was the, he was the main man. And you're talking about his brain as much as the fact that he was quite yeah. a hard fella. He was a great I was a massive, massive, man. massive fan of Giles. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I love John Giles. Yeah. So the challenge is to go there, and, and I don't want to lose the... Because you made my eyebrow raise there, because there's no way that Vinny's the pantomime villain that he portrays himself mm. to be, but you must have played equally against yeah. Vinny. One or two interesting battles for Leicester Leeds and Div 2, and then you get him sort of not just saying tacitly... Let's go out for a drink and I'm going to work working in my club, but I know you're here to take my place, more or less. That must have been a well, wee bit of a surprise. The, the, the second last game of the season when Leeds came up was against Leicester City, and that was who I was playing for. You know, and that, I had no indication that Leeds were going to come in for me, so I had no idea. So I scored at Ellen Road to nearly put a span on the works, you know, because Leeds needed to win their last two games. Just, just almost to stop them going up and buying you. But the, as you can imagine, as the two teams are coming through the tunnel to start that game, the squad for Italian 90 had been named. And I was a second division player going to Italy with Scotland. And there was a few verbals from Vinny. Vinny was, <laughs> Vinny was going to try and make sure that I wasn't going to go to you, Italy. You forget Italy. But, you know, that's, you use that as inspiration. You know, that's the thing. That was what he was in the team for. That was it. He was, he was there to spoil and waste. And he, he played it cleverly, Vinny. And he, he, he's, he was better than most thought. You know, you were never a, a huge muscular figure. You were a clever footballer, but... What did that do to you when players wanted to put you off or maybe give you one or two when the referees would give them three or four before the yellow card came out? How did you handle that over the PC of your career? I, you know, the, the, one of the things when obviously when somebody was maybe given a job to mark or just take you at the game, it goes right back to, you know, just your upbringing. You know, I signed with Motherwell, David Hay, but then it was Jock Wallace. Jock Wallace was the guy that sort of, you know, says, you, listen, you need to know how to protect and how to you know, protect yourself on a, on a park. And, and if that's bringing people in closer to you and moving it quicker, mm -hmm. but just having that awareness, you know, you're not going to go and crash into big 50-50 challenges. You need to be wiser than that. So it's just that awareness to play in one and two touch when it was in tight little is And then maybe taking touches to, to pull the guy that was trying to take you out of the game. Just bring him closer, then eliminate him, you know, by passing the football, not getting involved in any... Other stuff. I don't know. It's like fishing, or it's like using wit, and it's having spatial awareness and all that. But equally, you'll, you'll be caught every now and again. We sat in this series and talked to Charlie Nick, who played in a different mm, position for yeah. you. But I didn't know that Charlie. He reckons he was the first to tape shin guards on the back of his calf yeah. and all that, just to protect himself. And he was, he was so forgiving about the people who kicked him. I couldn't believe it. I suppose it's a bit of a compliment when somebody's actually. Targeting you as the as somebody that's going to you know heap a bad result on you on, on you. So you, I always seen it as if somebody's going to try and come and man mark you or just try to put studs in the back here. It was a, it's a it's a hidden compliment. And when you're starting to train, at what point do you hear that the tumblers clicking? That this midfield of speed and Batty and Strachan mm -hmm. and yourself are suddenly going to be not only good but something special. Is it is yeah. it? Is it in the chats? Is it on the training ground? Is it in crucial match moments? When do you well, begin? To well, know? the thing was the first and foremost was the was the first pre-season, and I arrived and and uh, the first thing that really hit me was that how far I was actually behind in fitness of a, a little thirty-five-year-old ginger fella. <laughs> it, it, it quite simply blew blew me away. Really. And I remember Howard Wilkinson saying, "You actually, I think you've got the confidence to realise. You, I think you fancy yourself as a player." You'd back yourself against most. I said, of course I would. You imagine where your game could go if you had the fitness of Gordon. Arriving at Leeds at 25, you know, it was just another little penny that just dropped in. I thought I was a good player and I thought I could go and play for Scotland, you know, in the, in the World Cups and stuff. But when he just sort of said, when I seen what Strachan was doing fitness-wise and the way he wore down opponents by not only his skill, but the constant... You know, just keep going at people, running them back the pitch, and eventually getting in their head and beating them physically. As an older fella, as an older guy coming to the end of his career, I think the three of us, you know, the two other boys were younger than me, but it's no coincidence that Batty played on in his 30s and Gary Speed played away up in his 30s, and I played, you know, because we took on board what Gordon was doing. No shadow of a doubt about that. He was a massive influence on the three of us. 
But then there was an understanding which, which was special. You had a, a young Gary Speed on the left who, we wee bit like Eric Black in the air. You know, Scottish guys will know that Eric Black had this ability to hang. Speed could do it, come up at, come in at the back post. Batty was just a, a very underestimated footballer, but, but was capped many times when England. Fantastic player. Great insurance policy for the three of us. So as much as it might have been a 4-4-2, four, four, which is maybe mm-hmm. straight lines, mm-hmm. You can understand that Strachan didn't stand in the way. He came in as a sort of semi old fashioned inside right. Speed to, maybe, was, to maybe let Sterling so go around him. Yeah, and, and, and Batty would be the deeper one. So mm-hmm. all of a sudden, in some games, I would come deeper with, with Bat. So there's a 4 2 3 1 development. And mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I get bamboozled with all this tactical stuff now of 4 3 3s and 4 5 1. By moving three and four feet and three and four yards, 4 4 2 jumps into them yeah. in an instant. You know, you, and the good teams. Adapt and do it well, and we did that subconsciously. Well, what would you make that decision on then, based on let's say that nominally Gary might be out, maybe might begin out left, and Gordon might begin out right, and they would do what they would do, and I'm sure they would buy predominantly positionally moved the least of the four of you. Yeah. Well, I suppose he boxed the box every now and again. Yeah. However, when you chose where to go and what to do, depending on a game, uh, the turf, an opponent. Uh, mm. How did you factor that in? And did you do it instinctively? Did you know about opponents in, in advance? Or, you know, a week ahead? Of, I'll tell you what, this is, I remember him from last time, or that's what they don't like. Or, uh, what would you do? Well, I think that, I think that another big thing, that I know it's in, in today's players, I think, you know, I, I never want to be that player harping back to the day when I played in players, but, but decision-making was on the pitch, you know, so, if it, so say you're going into a game against the Arsenal, and, which is going to be really tight, and you're fighting your corner for every little inch, but then you might come into a stronger period in the game where you're dominating, and that just allows, you know, so there's a sixth sense between the four, yeah. and the, maybe the, the Rod Wallace who was playing off Lee Chapman, just to come into a link, and then all of a sudden there's a natural rhythm and a flow you're in Spain, you see it, you've seen it with the greatest, you know, the movement and the way they, once they've sensed a dominance, there's a natural little flow in movement and, and, and you don't have to think about it. Players of the same ilk just go into little slots. You and, see, and I, it agree becomes... with, I agree with you, but I, I'm obviously not a world-class footballer who's won the title and who's had experience and therefore I learn slowly as I watch. Mm. I'm watching, I'm asking them, I'm talking to them, I'm trying to learn. But what confuses me a little bit is that they, they do exactly what you said, that they interpret, they intuit, that there's not a lot of communication, and the movement will be intelligent, but it's all based around ruthless systems at Barcelona, mm-hmm. not the other clubs. Mm-hmm. Ruthless systems, mm-hmm. whereby they've done it so often since the majority of them were 10, through, yeah. that it's like a Swiss watch. And then what you do is, if all of that is functioning mm-hmm. perfectly and you throw in Pep Guardiola and they're super fit, and you've got the element of that mm-hmm. intuitive, creative, I'll do this now because I just know it's right. Then that becomes mm-hmm. extraordinary. To me, what you've just been talking about, there's probably a greater value because that midfield has been put together by buying. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if David came through all the way through the club. Both, but both Barry and Speed came through, the, came through the, the academy. The question then is, was the academy training them in a way all the way through that it was meant to provide well, well, them certain... You know, the, the, they were both apprentices. And David Batty tells a wonderful story. David Batty, they love and adore. They were young kids under Billy. Billy Brenner was the manager when they were apprentices. So they hung on to every word. And obviously Billy still joined in. The little disguise and the, and, and the looking away and, and looking one way and passing it the other, which was one of Billy's favourite little movements. Batty and Speed did it, you know, and, and they seen the, the demands that Brenner put on himself to go and hunt and take the ball under under pressure, you know, and, and to make passes and get the dominance. So they, they were brought up very much with that great Leeds team. That was their upbringing. And, and Batty tells a story. They were training one day in the, in the training ground at Ellen Road, just above the, the car park. It was five, six inches of mud, horrible winter's day. And Billy had been away trying to sign somebody, so he'd arrived. He arrived at the training just at the end of the session when they'd gone into a little, little later side. And Billy arrives with the manager's uniform. He's got a grey mohair suit, a sheepskin coat and a pair of loafers. And Billy simply takes off the sheepskin and joins in. No. And he's hitting little reverse passes and playing one-twos in six inches of mud <laughs> with a pair of loafers on. <laughs> and his moccasins and his beautiful suit. Fantastic. Is, is that the love of a footballer or what? I, There's nothing... Just give me the pill. That was, that was like, <laughs> give me the pill. <laughs> he's, he's an awful sad loss and... 
he's iconic too. You mentioned that thing about Bobby Collins and Gordon and Billy and Fay. We, we seem to have lost that a little bit. I'm trying to think if we have a footballer of that ilk now or recently, right. and if that's a society change or not. But what I remember is him for Scotland with in that era when they were beating Czechoslovakia at the beginning yeah. to qualify for tournaments and it just felt I mean as a youngster then it, I can <clears throat> understand how David and Guy might have been inspired by him yeah. because to me they, they were a blend of warriors also they seemed to be able to play football better than anybody else nah, they, were, they were special you know, I think the first you know the, my memories of them are obviously those games against Chelsea in the finals and stuff but also in a Scotland shirt I suppose it would be 74, you know, and you know, the games against Zaire and stuff, you know, so it was oh, yeah. weird. Where Peter Lorimer scores one of his classicals and, and my dad keeps cropping up in these, which I suppose your dad will, but dad said to me before the tournament, because I, th- I think there was maybe, maybe only one Aberdonian in the squad and it's Dennis. Mm-hmm. Dad said to me, oh, listen son, you, you've just caught him too late, he's, he's just not quite what he was. He said, do you want to see what he was? And I'm like, no, dad is dead. No, I, I don't know what, I was nine or something, mm-hmm. of course I knew better. Because Dennis was just that inch yeah. or two, it wasn't quite there, and he got a bit of game time. And we kind of went, we froze, we froze against Zaire, and then Billy misses that one. That must have I know. lived with him forever and ever against Brazil, where you don't know how it's gone by. And then we just don't quite turn up for 80 minutes against Yugoslavia, and then hey oh, and then it's we're a, out again. And it's a normal, Joe gets his it's goal a and, normal little scenario. But, it's, but we never lost a game. I know, but we're good at that. We seem to be. And um, when it's blending, at what stage do you think um, fourth fourth in the first season? Fourth in the first season. Bloody hell. You know, you look at the examples today, you know, if teams come up, you know, there's so much money at stake now to be Before the bottom will do. So that the, the target is literally just survival. I think we were up in second and third quite a bit, you know, and but fourth was a great achievement. But it also gave everybody in that dressing room thinking, and Howard was saying, Next time round, we've got a chance. Mm-hmm. We can influence the top. I mean, and there was, a, there was a definite belief in the changing room, but more importantly, in the city. The city, the fans had seen enough, and they, they, are, they play a big part. They play a big part at Ellen. Ellen Road's one of those grounds, like Anfield, like Old Trafford, like Celtic Park, like Ibrox. Those stadiums where the crowd can make a, make a difference in that second season. We can say hostile, can't we, without oh, saying it's dangerous, there's, there's but that, hostile. There's that nastiness there. Yeah. You know, they, they don't make the opposition feel welcome. And, you know, that was something, as soon as I started wearing the white shirt of Leeds United, you know, the, there was teams that quite simply couldn't deal with it. They collapsed really early in games. And we had, can remember loads of times thinking, 20 minutes gone, 2-0, it's done. They've gone. Yeah. Quite happy that the opposition were happy to get out of there that, with 2-0. That must feel it's a nice feeling, so you know. So good. Yeah. Because you know you've got when you've got people you can enjoy the rest yeah. of the game and, and show the fans. And, and then and you're talking about the momentum grows. All the interlinking and Strachan's getting on the ball and speed and it was a good side. A real, real good side. I understand that, but I think that if you you know look, it seems to me that the real quality was in was in midfield. Chapman was maybe underestimated a little yeah. bit. I'm going to ask Goal you. Goal scoring wise, you look at Chap. Chappie's record stands up against nearly, nearly most, right up there with the very top. It know, seemed as played. if people didn't like the cut of his jib, or maybe they thought he was a tiny little bit limited, but he got in the right place, physically good, good in the air. He was so hungry just to score goals. And, and when you say limited, yeah, he would hold his hand up. He wasn't a top footballer. You know, in the five aside and the little keep ball sessions, he was limited. But come the day in the game, mm. you know, that this, this art of, you know, I've seen so many people trying to coach in strikers and watch the movements of strikers, they just know where to go. It's in there, they isn't it? And, and again, I don't know if it is, co- they can be coached to get into certain areas and get their goals, but those nil-nil tight games, where to go when it's ricocheting off something that lands at them and they poke it in. Well, where to go when they've got service from you and Gordon and maybe Gary as well. That, that, that was the thing. I suppose with the... With the fullbacks, did, and, uh, I don't remember. Did I would ask them to go? Oh, they were they were very much. They got really I, high. Remember Merle Nelson certainly getting up and down. I mean, well, the flying pig. He, I didn't was know that. That's his, that's his I nickname. Didn't you know, know he was, that. He, he, I'm going to throw a name in here, but he had that ability to be running away from the goal. You know, on the right wing, yeah. maybe facing the side of the pitch, and he could wrap his foot round. 
I'm thinking of Manny Kaltz, you know, was the German. God, aye. Manny yeah. Kaltz was, in, in, and I used to, you know, I've said that to Didi Haman, and he was, they called him banana M feet. M Manny Kaltz, if I remember correctly, played at Pataudry, when he was a massive threat, and they scared the, the shit out of you because they were big and remorseless and they ran all day, but then when you when they got the ball, they were also they good. Could play. He was, played with his socks at his ankles as well, if you can remember. He I used to could whip it. He could, you know, he'd be that. facing there and wrap his foot round it. So Mel was like that. And obviously Mel and Chappie played together at Sheffield Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So when, whenever, whenever Mel got wide, there was none of this looking to maybe try and play balls into feet. It went in the box. It went mm. in that area, mm. you know, between the back four and the keeper. Because I don't remember what... Did he change in the summer between fourth and then winning the championship? Did he add little bits or promote kids or...? No, there was nothing. No, no major no changes? Major, no major changes, no. Well, you talked about the town believing and that was one of the... You probably met half the people who ever watched you, but mm -hmm. Matthew Lister. Mm -hmm. Graham, just tell Gary Mack, thank you. I was 17 in 1992. I might live to be 100 but I doubt I'll be privileged enough to see a side of that quality wearing our shirt again. Strach, Bats, Gary Mack and Speedo. That's what you call a midfield from Matt. And I think that maybe is emblematic of what you yeah. said, that, that they all they knew in the moment. And at what stage in the season can you remember when you went, nah, this isn't just what the manager said and what we believe this is happening? Well, I tell you, there's, a, there's one defining moment and I can remember it, I can, I can picture myself. There's a tough end of town up to the north of Leeds, a place called Seacroft, Gibton. And I'd been asked to go and judge a karaoke. And there was a big, you're big, you're massive, it. You massive... laughing because you're ticking all my boxes. Massive, massive Leeds stronghold. This, you know, yeah. this, this where all the proper Leeds fans are from. The massive Leeds support in this area. And that particular night, Manchester United, who had been, I think, Man United might have been 10 points ahead of us at, at Easter. So we're after Easter and Man United is just starting to falter a wee bit. And the, but there was one, it was at Upton Park and West Ham had turned Manchester United over. And that, from that moment, you can remember the result coming through into this social club and the place going boom. And I'm thinking, wow. And I can remember seeing the goal. I think it was West Ham's goal was like a block tackle. I think Tim Breaker challenged oh, yeah. somebody and it just flew right in the top corner. And you thought... And Jim Beglin, I was with Jim Beglin. And we, I think we looked at each other and thought... Something's we, going we on here. Have, we might have a wee chance here. What a feeling. Tell me a little bit about... What was Cantona like? Is, is his arrival or... Well, his arrival is... Is, is, a, is it overplayed a little bit? No, but... Yeah, it overplayed a little bit, but... Huh. I, I wouldn't say his arrival was overplayed. His arrival was sensational. You know, I don't know if you know how the, the sequence of events went. He'd arrived into the country. Platini obviously wanted him to get games. He'd fallen out with people in France. Everybody. So he needed to get to England. Gerard Hooley phoned Trevor Francis. So he goes into Sheffield Wednesday. Mm -hmm. But there's a big downfall of snow. Because of the weather permitting, they can only train indoor. The two days that Eric is at Sheffield Wednesday is on an astroturf pitch under, under the roof. Mm -hmm. So... Trevor says, well, I can't make a judgment, you know, I, you know, till I see you on grass. I don't know if those words went down too well with Eric. <laughs> so he jumps, he jumps in a car and makes a few phone calls and I think it, the message gets to Howard. So he comes and trains at, at Ellen Road. So we go through the normal little training session and then we go to a wee bit of finishing. And within 10 seconds he scores a, an overhead kick, a hitch kick, you know, bicycle kick, whatever you want to call it. And everybody just looks at each other and looks at Howard and go, <laughs> sign him. Yes, please sign him. <laughs> you know, when he was, it was like that, seriously. But I, I know a lot of people will, will look at that title winning season and say that Eric was integral, but he wasn't. He played, I don't know. You need to look at the stats. I don't, know if, I, I, don't know if, I don't even know if he played a dozen games. No, I was going to say know, 10. But what he did was, as teams were aware that we were really challenging, we were coming to Ellen Road and literally parking the bus in a new modern term. And Eric, he did change games. You know, we were struggling to break teams down. He would come against Chelsea, scored a wonderful goal, flipping over, over the big fella Elliot. A couple of goals against Luton. You know, there was two or three games at Ellen Road where we were struggling to break the, the opposition down and he came on. And, so he, he, he did, certainly played a part. Certainly played a part. Wait. But but nowhere near. The it's of kind of mythical. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, more, it's more about what he went on to do 
and people referred back and said he was, he was the man. I kind of reinvent a little bit backwards. Yeah. We spent some time with Chrissy Ward on this series and, and, and Chris really quite liked Eric mm -hmm. and also said that he, was, he bore no resemblance to what you could think of him if you only saw, if you only read about cursing at referees and then throwing a book at a panel of people finding him and falling out with whoever it was mm. and, and jumping off into the Crystal Palace fan who might have you had it coming. He thought he was a terrific pro and a good lad and fun to train with. What was it with the football, just talking about the football with you and him and Gordon and him, was it easy to understand? Was it just like there was something quite natural because oh, yeah. you've all got a, a nice domination of the ball? It was one of those occasions where the football language is totally international. There was no need to communicate. Or, you know, it was just that he, he knew and he could see, you know, and he fell into little areas. There was, he was a, he's a quality footballer and he, he's proved that. Hmm. Moving on after we'd won the league, it was really bizarre the way things just deteriorated with him and the manager. And I was quite pally about it, and, and he sort of was looking to me, and obviously I was a captain after that season, so I'm Howard's captain, and, and, and there it is. I was caught in between a little bit, to be perfectly honest. At the time of his departure, I, I don't know if there was any other options left to Howard. Mm -hmm. It had become un untenable, it was, it was really destructive in the training. A bit sulky. Sulky, yeah, which makes it really awkward, and it was yeah. that awkwardness. I suppose the only thing was, you know, in hindsight, it's a wonderful thing, you don't sell on to Man United. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think that you know. I think I think that originally it was Howard went inquiring for Dennis Irwin to try yeah. and bring Dennis back to Leeds. He started at Leeds, yeah. and Fergie went, "No, no, no. I don't think he's for sale. But we'll take Cantona." And <laughs> then it was like he'd gone. Do you know? And the weirdest thing is because living abroad now, I I, I begin to miss out on some of this tapestry of our football, mm -hmm. which I think is always. Almost as interesting behind the scenes, not the rows, but the personalities, the decisions, the trends. And it was only recently I found out, and I don't know if it was common knowledge, that Fergie had decided that that creative move, the ball, that linchpin mm -hmm. number 10 player Focal that he was, was Peter yeah. Beardsley. Yeah. And that. And, and then, just, he just fell upon and then, and he, he was about to start doing the thing for Pierre, and then yeah. literally, as you say, he was like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Couldn't believe his luck. Things you know, like I, there was obviously wee things when Eric went to, you know, it was the time of all the youngsters coming on the scene at, at Manchester United and how impressed they were of, of Eric staying behind at training. So it was similar, you know, like Batty and Speed were the same, you know. Were they? And Strachan would come and, and Eric would always come and join that, that, you know, just behind, you know, bending free kicks and having cracks at the goal. And obviously, the young players at Manchester United bought into that as well and, and seen the practice and practice and practice, the muscle memory, the muscle memory, you know, and, and all of a sudden Beckham and Scholes can, they can put a ball in a sixpence, can't they? Just by repeating and repeating. Oh, muscle memory wasn't something that you knew about then, it was. It's a brilliant term, but mm -hmm. that must be going back to what we spoke about, the fitness, that you, you yeah. must have known that by now rather oh, than by... Do you know what? I did know because I was a, I'm a, I was a low handicap golfer. And hitting pounding balls and hitting balls, and you create pressure when you're playing the, your monthly medal. But so, but when you trust in your swing, and you've hit balls and hit balls and hit balls, when you've got up the last two or three holes, it's the same as when you're, you're in the last minute of a game to right, hit a penalty. So you're drawing me in here to where I didn't want to go because in the last few episodes, we've talked a lot about penalties, mm -hmm. and I don't mean Wembley. We talked. Um, well, I'll tell you about Michael Wembley Carrick. because my phone was nearly just went off there, uh -oh. and. There's a chap that still to this day calls me, staking his claim that he made the ball move. <laughs> and if you want to look at there, if people ask me what's the best, what's the best contact you've got on your phone, I've got Yuri Geller, who's still sitting no, with me. No, it's not Yuri. I don't if, believe when, when you. This, when this pops up and on the radio, he'll have his people and he'll be back on, <laughs> God bless him. He'll be on saying, I made Gary talk about that. Yeah, yeah. he's... And, yeah. And, and listen, folks, to all you subscribers to the beginning of you, there is a weirdly shaped fork on the table here that when we began chatting was straight. <laughs> it's funny, like, oh, you, you beautifully... I don't know if that's a tactic, but you battered me off course on the penalty muscle mm -hmm. memory thing because when I moved down to London at Daily Mail, I had to cover England for my sins, mm -hmm. which was great. It was absolutely fabulous. And Yuri was about, and Yuri, either by invitation of Glenn, who had no other strange tip, oh yeah, and Drury, Yuri was planting crystals in four corners of the 1998 
stadia to make sure that England couldn't lose. And when they beat Morocco or Tunisia, Tunisia yeah. in the first game in Marseille, where Glenn puts David Beckham on the bench, you claimed the credit, saying oh. they, they couldn't score because I had to... I didn't know he did a say at Euro '96. Oh yeah, he's he. Yuri, I'm not impressed. He made the he made the ball move. There's there's a point when you when you're a penalty taker. There's yeah. a point of no return when you're a penalty taker. Yeah. When you plant your standing foot. For me, I, I I still as I'm going down to hit the ball, I'll still have a little look under here to see if the keeper's moving his feet and trying to go really early and try to read it. But then when you're upon the ball, you you, yeah. you know. So when I see the ball moving, mm -hmm. half a ball, mm -hmm. you can imagine there's a million things in a millisecond. I'm thinking, if I stop, I'll fall over the ball. I'm mm -hmm. at Wembley. I'm playing. Mm -hmm. I'm captain. Please God, that's not so that. that's <laughs> right. So so there's that. I, I think. Well, I try and just run over it. If I glance at, I've took it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking this, this is all going through me. So so the decision is just to blast it. Seaman makes a save. It's on target. Seaman has to make a save. And they've got Gaza scores the wonder goal. But when you talk about... Um, yeah, thanks, Gaz. That was probably Yuri as well. Um, when you talk about muscle memory and penalties, I don't want to hammer a theme, but I'm also... I'm into it now because Michael Carrick was talking about Moscow and the tension and what was going on in his head and how he decided to run up to it and, mm -hmm. and get there quickly and what he decided to do. and what he felt like when it went in and on and on and on and then Dr. to Geiska Mendieta who, who until he came to England and even then he only missed like one just didn't miss mm -hmm. and scored and scored and scored he did a Dennis Irwin but he did a Dennis Irwin at the Bernabeu and he yeah. did it for Spain and whatever and I, I've always disagreed with people who say particularly coaches say well it, do, it doesn't matter how much you practice oh. the tension is a okay the tension and the crowd changes things mm -hmm. but it does matter how much you practice Absolutely. because if you're worried about your technique and then there's the pressure on top of yeah. it, there's a bigger chance you're going to miss. I, 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 I totally agree, and, I, and I, that goes with free kicks. It goes with, you know, I would put in the same bracket and come the last minute and the ball breaks nicely to you in your centre. You see the centre forward at the corner of your eye. If you've hit two or three hundred balls across the training field, yeah. diagonals, that last minute and it comes, it lands and you just drop it there. That's because you've practised. You know, that's just no natural. That's something that you've actually put yourself in. And because, you know, the pressure's on, but you know you can hit it. So mm. you're confident you can just go boom. I think it's one less thing you're thinking about too. Mm. Particularly in that it's distribution a, a natural, you're talking about where there's somebody you're aiming at rather than aiming at a net. Mm -hmm. You can think, or you can start to think about where's the wind? What's the drift? Does this keeper like to come for it? Is, is Lee somebody who goes front post or back post? You, even whatever there's filters loads of, your there's mind. loads of stuff. You're not thinking about your I, foot you know, in the I, bottom. I, 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 this is something again that I just that that me and I've, and over you know the years of playing football and, and playing golf, you know hitting a one iron into the wind is a different trajectory. You know if you're playing into the wind in a football patch, you're going to have to hit it differently. If you set it up, it'll just balloon. So there's, there's that sort of punch drive, mm -hmm. which you would you know, it's like an old Scottish shot on a link. On a link, of course, yeah, yeah. So it's there's so many little things that go through your mind and. and Again, you're going to get little bits of visualisation of seeing it, seeing the pass, and seeing how it, how you want to hit it. There's loads of things coming to your mind. My my penalty kick taking technique was I copied Glenn Hoddle. I sort of bent my run up, so I would go away and, and arrive at the ball at an angle, and I favoured high up into the keeper's left. That would be my stop penalty. So I don't. Right foot to your right to the keeper's yeah, left. Keeper's left. But then if the keeper went early, I would just simply wrap my foot round it and go low into the other corner. Did you ever loft it? Did you ever panenka it? Never did that. Never. Mm. That takes a bit. I remember that when, when I was growing up watching all this, and after Panenka did it, which the whole world went mad, particularly because they beat mm. Germany, which I was just in cartwheels on. It was years and years and years till people started trying it. I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I could <laughs> ever do it. Just the consequences to your teammates if you, yeah. if you miss. It seems worse if you miss that one, does it? Oh, absolutely. The thing that, I don't know if it appeals to you or not, but it still interests me, and I was, when we were preparing, just, I don't know if it seems like we did prepare or not, but we were. <laughs> they call it the Battle of Britain, and you've already talked about Billy doing that for Leeds against Celtic at Hamden in spring 1970, I suppose. I don't know if there were other battles of Britain afterwards. Possibly there were, but not as big. No, oh, that one, as, that's as a standout one, isn't it? That's, you, the, that's you, the last big one, isn't it? It is, and I think in between, I don't think there was anything as big as what we're about to talk about, which, before the draw was made and the, the ball came out of the hat and it was Leeds Rangers, there was a good deal of mucking about went on. 
Did you have to go to... We Stuttgart, yeah, Stuttgart, obviously we lost quite heavily in Germany in the first game, 3-1. We come back to Ellen Road and they score first to go 4-1. And then we go, I think we win 5-2, so they're through on the way goals. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, La is it, was it Lamb? The manager, Lamb, at Stuttgart. At that time, you were only allowed two foreign players on the pitch at any given time, and they put a third one on, Godinho, which then they should have been thrown out the competition. That's because of the German clout and, and UEFA, yeah. they got another game. The game's played in Camp Nou. Camp Nou, yeah. With nobody there. Had you been there before? Never. That was my first. Oh, As fan and visitor, from, footballer. I'd, I'd actually been on the outside of it. I never took the trip inside. So I'd been in Barcelona, the city, obviously took the, the pilgrimage to Camp Nou, and, and, but never went inside. Then to go inside it, you know, and it's, I always sort of ask myself, you know, if I ever had the opportunity yeah. of maybe at any given time, that if I'd been given the chance to play at Madrid or Barca, oh, yeah. uh, Barcelona, is, there's something about the place, something about the kit, something about, it's magical. Do you think it's because we're Scots and Catalans or, or not? Maybe, maybe that, I, that I don't independent know. as that, that being Some together. sort of us against the world type Aye. thing, whereas Madrid are like, we are the world. Yeah. <laughs> they have that sort of northern supremacy. Yeah, I, th I think it's in there. I think at least it's in there. You know, For me, it was always Cruyff. And, and, years and years and, and years and before anything it. else happened. And, it. and then Cruyff. I just couldn't believe him. But you, so you, you've seen it, but now you're playing in it, but it's empty. I suppose that must was, have been not as good, but also weird. They were kind of just bizarre. It was surreal. Yeah. You know, because you're, you know that. I was, I've been in New York recently and you do that to get to the top of the skyscrapers <laughs> but you know that you've got it to get like the neck that. back to get to the yeah. top of it and it I think there was about 20 fans managed to get in somehow and they were up at the right up in the gods and we turned them over Strack scored a great goal and then Carol shut unsung hero That's yeah I, I remember the name but I know nothing else about him you don't really want to know much about him. Thank you very much. We'll move swiftly. You know, he, was, he, was, okay. he was a good boy. Well, oh, Carl, you, you did a thing, and if it was at night time, because I've been there so late, some nights when it's empty, and the spooky. stadium is infested by bats. It is spooky, oh, and there are bats everywhere. Now, you're concentrating on playing and shouting, so you probably didn't hear them. I will guarantee you there's the biggest bat audience you'll ever have in your life, no matter what and you do. Obviously, there was massive celebrations after the game because the draw had been made. We knew we were playing Rangers. Oh, so the Rangers, that. the draw had been made. So Walter, Walter was at the game, obviously. And we, we, we bumped into... Who do you and think you after, for? And after the game, it was an international game. So obviously, I was going back in the same flight as Walter and Bats. You know, the Leeds team went back to Leeds, but Batty was going to England, Gary Speed was going to Wales. And we bumped into Walter. And that was just after we'd been chaperoned through all the nightclubs and bars in Barcelona by a Barcelona legend, Steve Archibald, CB. who obviously has to walk about Barcelona with a cap and a raincoat. He did, he was, he's mad. I didn't realise how he is a proper ledge. He Ooh, got yes. his in everywhere. Front of the queue, boom, Steve Archibald, well, in you come. My first week when I moved there, I phoned it and asked about, I, this is not a euphemism, I phoned it and asked about schools. For my, then my daughter, he was fantastic, he was brilliant, and he did me like a kid, but he went out. And, Listen, when you're over, we'll go out. So we went out and we got out to the restaurant. He said, oh, Most is in London, and I kind of knew what was going to happen then. And I saw what it was like to be out in the town with Stevie Archer. It was unbelievable. Wow. She was, if I ever wished I'd been in a successful football before, <laughs> I wished for it then. And he handles it with good style. And they all touch, they all touch there. Yeah. Archie Gold is in the touch of the ear because he scored this goal with his ear against That's Juventus. Right, yeah. So you'd, you'd seen the libraries and the museums and but the art galleries. There's also, and there's also a good story that, that Gordon tells, and obviously he's an ex teammate of, of Archie Stevie's. And, uh, Title winners. And they, Thank you. They used to do a wee bit of Mickey taking. So I don't think his start at Barca was great. He started pretty slowly. I don't know if stories grow arms and legs, but Gordon tells the story and it's, he's, he's at a press conference and he's obviously got that, he's got the hundred mics, you know, yeah, two inches away. Exactly right. And the sort of first floor, the first question from the floor is, um, apart from doing nothing, what is it you do? <laughs> <laughs> and they, I think they always used to just ram that down his throat. Well, it's just so many years later, by the time I'm over there, and I don't know if everybody's like this, but Scots, we get irate. And Stevie's a firm character, you would mm -hmm. confirm. Stevie knows his worth. Mm -hmm. So he told me, this was in the years before Laporta's revolution and Clive was still there and the De Boers and whatever. 
and we were talking away one day, and I didn't praise Cliver, but I mentioned Cliver. He said, I take my boy down to the camp now specifically to tell him every week how much better than Cliver I was. <laughs> He's young and he needs to know. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> bravo, Stevie. Bravo, bravo. And I, I, I wouldn't I, argue for a I, second, Stevie was a phenomenal footballer with yeah. great touch and technique. Great and player. he still, I mean, it's really rare across the city, which he did play that in Espanol, mm. and to be remembered with affection too. And he had something that, with a slimmer body, but he had, he had some of the same beautiful control and holding the ball and using the ball that Mark Hughes did later. Right. It was much, he's such a technically good yeah, footballer. And, and I just was not aware how big he was. You know, I know, I knew he was successful there, but yeah. it wasn't until that night you realised he was he was massive. They, they listen. They got to a European Cup final, and although the, the experience itself was absolutely atrocious, they won a the title. They beat Madrid regularly, and it was a time when Spain was beginning to open up because Franco had only died before Stevie went over there. Frank had only died about eight years oh, right. so, yeah, earlier. And, and it took, when you've had a dictator for 40, 45 years, or a mm. Creole dictator who you know, the Catalans under his thumb. Some, yeah. It doesn't change overnight. And it, it, there was this blossoming. And if you get a sports team that won the league and yeah. was attracting Schuster and Venables and Archibald yeah. and whatever, it was that beginning to believe yeah. thing about, we, well, it must have been a wonderful place <clears> to be <throat> at the time. I, yeah. I guess it was extraordinary. So you fly back with Walter having, as I said, done the, the tour, I think you said the art galleries and yes. libraries and, and, and Absolutely. cultural centres of Barcelona. So you're on the same flight back as Walter and Walter's delighted that it's Leeds and you or no, wish that it had been Stuttgart or...? or no, because the, it was the first time that we were going to break into little groups, you know, and it was a shame because, you know, very rare that the British and the English champions come up against the Scottish champions and we had drawn the German champions. So to draw the German champions in the first round and the Scottish champions in the second, it was, it was a week we were unlucky. Yep. And it would be much better if we'd avoided each other. Two. There were two great games, but it would be much nicer if the two has progressed and got an, an easier draw. It was just a draw that was, I don't think anybody really wanted it. What seeped into it? Because <clears throat> it's a slightly difficult, well, it's an unusual position for you to be in. Yeah, because I'm, I'm playing against, well, there must be five, six in the Rangers team that are Scotland teammates. So that was, you know, my, my knowledge of Rangers was, I knew them inside out and I knew what the game was going to be like. A period where Rangers were obviously dominating Scotland, but they had good players. You know, they had very good players. You know, Hayley McCoy up front. You know, McCall, Durant, Golf, Brown. Gorham, was, Gorham was a bit and special. And the goalie. Gorham was a bit special. And, and, and on occasions, I'll flick the game on still. Generally, when I go up the road, my dad will have it on <laughs> to this day. And the game at Ellen Road, Eric Cantona's, Eric's threw in, Eric's threw in the goalie four times. Gorham out foxes him with his football brain. Gorham was a good player. He was a good outfield player. And he was very good in one-on-ones because he, he could read strikers. You know, he, he, thought, he thought more like an outfield player than a goalie. So he, he, he couldn't get big because he wasn't big. You know, he just played played a confident games. bloke as well. <coughs> a great keeper. Brilliant with the national team. Good cricketer. And I can t- testify to the fact that he's a bloody good table tennis player too because he no, thrashed me in Denmark. Swine. So it's... It's not too sore an experience because you know you're losing a quality team, but English teams and Rangers under Sunas, training's often divided into Scotland and England. There's a bite, mm-hmm. there's an edge, there's, mm-hmm. there's bragging rights, there's piss taking. Oh, that part I, must I, I have been. obviously got hammered. You know, the, the Rangers boys were all over it. You know, they, obviously when we met up with the national team, they were get back down the road, you know, you put you in your place. You know, it was, there was all that. We, over the two games, John Lukic threw two in at Ibrox. We, you know, we scored in 50 se- I scored in 50 seconds. You know, we sh- the, the place was silent. Quite a good goal. Would, would quite, you like to quite a good des- goal. describe that? Well, goal. when it was just it arrived, very, it was one of those very ones. good so, goal. So, caught in the volley, obviously no away fans. That was agreed before the game, so it was the entire, the entire stadium was, was Rangers fans. So from going at the kick-off, when the referee goes to blow his whistle, I mean, I've never heard anything like it, and I can remember Strachan looking to me, and I looked to Batty, who looks to Speed, and the four years look across and go, wow, the noise, you know, I had hair, I had a wee bit of hair, and it was, every hair in my body was stood up. But then, to go through that, to 50 seconds later, and there was an unbelievable silence. Mm. Has it been disallowed, has somebody had a heart attack, has there been a fatality somewhere, there was silence. Mm. 
and I ran towards that Rangers enclosure. You know, my natural as I hit it, I run sort of that way to, and it was like. And I was greeted with some unpleasant. <laughs> 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 I watched these and you realised who you were running towards. Oh. Was there ever a. a like... I thought, yeah, I'll just check my run here and go back and yeah. hit that's, it well, but it was the wrong run. That's where the bears are. You know, <laughs> I was heading oh. towards them thinking they were like. They weren't like applauding a nice volley. Yeah, nice. Look, um, I, I don't want in any way to, to let down Coventry and Leicester fans, so I'm going to rely on you to drive us towards that where it's important because mm -hmm. they were both important clubs mm -hmm. for you and um, but what I do want to talk about is the it's probably a dirty lie mm -hmm. you know Jamie Carrick and what he can be like but in one of the interviews he, he said that Gerard was the coach <clears throat> at Liverpool and I suspect that so the, the next game up must have been because you were at Coventry and yeah? so according to Jamie hello Jamie who you said there's a fella in the midfield there and, you know, look at his age and his speed and we have to target him and he's the slowest player and we'll get, we'll get right on him. And it, as far as Jamie tells it, as you see mm -hmm. with Gordon and, and Stevie, they play, I don't know what the result is, but three weeks later, I'm <laughs> the same manager has yeah. gone and signed you. Well, you know, obviously I knew. Not that before day. that game, I no. Knew well, I, well I, I was aware of Liverpool's interest. Really? And that was the thing. So that was coming to a, a natural end of a four-year contract at Cove. I signed for Ron Atkinson. Gordon was his assistant. And then, obviously, after a year, Gordon took over. Gordon was aware that I was coming at the end of my contract. And they were basically monitoring my situation. I was 35, 36. I'd scored 13, 14 goals. Got a really good relationship with... A, a young guy we signed from Wolves, Robbie Keane, who was brilliant, 19-year-old. Mm. Robbie probably put me in for half my goals, little combinations. He was a fantastic player, great knowledge for somebody so young. So no surprise when he, he got his move to, to Inter Milan at the end of that season. And I, and I got to Liverpool, which the first phone calls I thought was a wind-up, you know, when, when, when I'd heard it. How does it come? Struan Marshall, who's, who's my agent. Ah. You know Struan, he's yeah. a Scots lad, Glasgow yeah. boy. He looked after Stevie, Cara, Nicky Barnby, Emil Heskey. So he's got four or five at Anfield. So the way Struan came to me, he says, well, Gerard's obviously really in the process of shaking off this Spice Boys image, hmm. you know, hmm. something that he really wanted. You know, obviously, Roy had gone mm -hmm. that era. He was trying, the older players that were associated with that, which I never ever bought into, actually. They were a good team. They would have been unlucky, that team. That team should yeah. have done better. But the whole Spice Boys thing hung around them a wee bit, and, and Gerard was trying to move the club away from that, and looking at maybe a senior player that could come in and, and bring something a wee bit different out of you know the Monday to Friday. You know he was he was pretty clear. He says you won't you know you won't be playing every game. We want to bring you in to lead by example in the way you go through training. And I had I had watched Strachan mm -hmm. how he conducted himself Monday to Friday, and I basically copied him. I knew how important Monday to Friday was. It wasn't a case you just breeze through the weekend, you turn up on a Saturday and you get eight out of ten. I, I knew what the gig was, but like every every competitive sportsman, once you get there you think, well, you know what, maybe I can influence things a wee bit more. Maybe, you know, and then you want to play. Mm -hmm. You know, that thought of, of just being the guy that try to take a lead from during the week. Why can't we be more influential on a match day? Wait, I I'd never for a second because if it sounds like this, it's wrong. Suggest that because things were good at Coventry, and I'd imagine that a good deal of the people around the club and certainly the fans would be looking at Gary McCarthy at Coventry, saying, "Yeah, he's doing something. He's doing something for us. He he's up there." And, and the moment you go to Liverpool and that and that competitive end mm. kicks in as well, you're also looking and, and you're saying, "This is Liverpool." And there's now new. There's a, there must have been a different expectation I'm, on you oh. as well. And and also if you were playing for the ghosts of. Peter Lorimer and Joe Jordan at Leeds. I guess you exactly. were thinking. Yeah, I imagine so. Spot on. So I've now got you know I've now got the Bleach and Sunnis and Hansen and Stevie Nicol and I've still got. So I, you know I always felt I'm, I can't let these guys down. Mm. My approach and my thinking was obviously I'd signed and, and first impressions are big. You know even you know getting into a dressing room as an experienced former Scotland captain. You know played a lot of football. First impressions are are massive. So you're I'm arriving pre-season. So. I don't think anybody in that dressing room would have doubted that I could pass the ball and play. But I'm 35, 36. So from minute one of the first day's training, 
my summer had been spent getting to a level of fitness where I would hit the ground running so that the players would see that I can still run. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was the first thing I had to try and show my teammates that oh, yeah, mate, he made a decent pass and he's been good at Leeds and won the league. But the pre-season, you can show people that... You want to be in the pack or you want to lead no, the pack? You're, or you're, you, want you're, to... you're wanting to be up in the top three, two or three. Again, I'm following the lead of a 35-year-old when I arrive at Leeds. Strachan's the 35-year-old, and he is miles ahead of everybody. You know, it's, so it's... And I think it worked. I think, it, I, think, I, I think then you get that... The respect that, you, that you're in. How did it come? Because you... <clears throat> you I, I'd imagine that you're not somebody who, who tries to rest the hierarchy towards you, but does it by showing what you're up to and showing what mm -hmm. you like. What was the hierarchy? What was the politics of that group? So the, you, you'd imagine, like... Paul Ince had gone, Steve Staunton had gone, Steve Staunton was in the process of gone, Dominic Matu had gone, so the, 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 there was... It was a time of change. In, in that wee tea room, you know, in the, in the stories, like, like we're doing now, we're talking about Brent, I'm talking about Strachan, and, and the young Gerrards and Owens and Fowlers and Carras, they're, you know, they're, we're, we're sitting there as much as... It wasn't just a British thing, but they're the guys that are drawn. You know, you're drawing the guys, they're the ones that are in early playing a wee bit of pool and a bit of table tennis early in the morning before training and you're, you're getting into their heads and, and getting their confidence. Telling them things or letting ah, them ask you things? or Anything. Just what we're doing now. Just talking right over all the football experience players and who you played with, Cantona, and just covering all the topics of, but all football. And how much does, with, with Gerard, oh yeah, having told you what he wants, to what extent does he kind of make sure he doesn't treat you as the teacher's pet? Or mm -hmm. to what extent does he does he maybe give you a little bit to show that? Oh, absolutely. Phil Thompson the same. You know, they were. I wasn't immune to any of that. You know, and I can. That's never. That's never been a problem. You know, when there's when it's there to be done, it's got to be done. You know, so there was never. I don't think it was ever seen as getting preferential or separate treatment. What Gerard would do is he would come to me and go, "Be prepared. You know, we, we go Saturday, Tuesday, Sunday this week." you will play Tuesday, Sunday, you won't play this Saturday. Mm -hmm. So he gave me a nudge so that I could mentally get my head prepared for obviously being dropped. I'm not playing this one. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit this one out. But then, you know, we'll maybe get a UEFA Cup tie at the time it was, you know. Or, and, then, and then there was a big game at the, on the Sunday. So I, I, I got the little nudge of when I was playing and when I wasn't playing. Which is good management because irrespective of your age, when you're that competitive, you've worked hard enough to show it right from the start, I'm a lead wolf. Yeah. When you're left out, it doesn't matter what for. A little bit of warning helps because it's going to sting. Absolutely. You're going to be... It, it, yeah. I presume you didn't take it happily, you know, even the, if you understood. There's, there's, one, there's, there's one. There's one that, obviously, which is massive to me, you know, and, and it really stung. It really it hurt more than... Probably one of the most disappointing, and then obviously the, the day turned out actually no bad. But we win the league cup. Mm -hmm. We're looking. We're going to get to the FA Cup final, Arsenal, and we're we're in Dortmund to play Alaves in the UEFA Cup final. So if you sat the whole squad in a, a room like this, round this a, a big dining table, like this, and you asked every player in that room, I think you could cut the room in half. So you asked the British players of the two finals, which one do you want to play in? Mm -hmm. Bear in mind that Gerard was always giving me the nudge of which one I was going to be playing in, mm -hmm. or which games I was going to play in. Know that I thought I'd play in any of them. Maybe I'll play in two of them. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me, I want to play in the FA Cup final. Mm -hmm. Because I grew up as a wee boy watching FA Cup finals. I used to go down over the border with my, my dad and, my, and all his mates to watch live coverage of BBC England in Moffat. Because it was normally, it was always Rangers Celtic. We yeah, ended up watching Rangers Celtic. <laughs> We'd drive down into the borders at Moffat and watch the English Cup. So there was no Wembley at the time. It was, the, it was, it was the Millennium. It's not Wembley. It's, but, it it's, was, but it was brilliant. But so I get told an hour and a half before the FA Cup final against Arsenal that I'm not playing. And I'd scored, I think I'd scored in four games in a row before it. But obviously that was sweetened and Michael scored these two goals and we won the FA Cup in the celebration. Gerard comes and nudges me in the side and he says, be ready, you'll be playing on, on Wednesday in Dortmund. And the UEFA Cup final, so... This is where I'd be a because you, you, you came on and... Ch the game was Arsenal's for a long, long oh, chunk of time. You came on and we changed get, Graham, things. we get battered. I, that, they battered us. I'm trying to be 
Oh, Gently. I'll never say it. And I think they tired. Was it brutal hot? Because it, I, I thought it was brutal. Well, hot I'd, in the day. I'd ice towels. Obviously, my I'm challenged a wee bit up here, up top. I, was, I, think, I was, think it's the look. It was. That is the look. Thank There's you. no doubt about that. But yeah. I think it was showing 100 degrees pitch side. Oh la la! One the you know the little thermometers were there. Obviously, 60,000 people inside there as well, but boiling. And and a good, hard-running, clever Arsenal side that deserve oh. their lead. They but they go, the don't day. they? They they particularly go in terms of the space that they allow. I think. Stefan Henshaw clears one off the line, which was just he only used one arm, which I think <laughs> that's why he got away with it. But that was clear. So that's two 0 in the game had been. How's your luck? I mean, these things but, happen. But then I just uh, come on, and there was a free kick up into the back post. Marcus Babel keeps it in the box, and Michael swivels and whack, it's it on the half turn. And then in Michael's second goal, it was. Great through ball from Patrick Berger, and he's, he's running away from Lee Dixon. And there can only be one square in the net where he can score, and he hits it. He hits that corner. It was an, an amazing goal. I still to this day don't quite know how he did it. It looked impossible, and it looks as if the keeper must get there. So you see, there's part of these things, well, how seeming no one saved it? But it's, it's a great finish. But you, I had felt, just watching, just as an observer, I was sitting watching with Johnny Greek and I said, this, this is turned, this is turned, there's only one side now. I don't know how it was going to happen. Do you know, by the end, I don't know, if you ever get a chance, to, uh, you know, I have watched it back, we could have won four. Mm. Even after that, with two other chances, you know, which we, I think with three versus one, Robbie, myself and Bergen were breaking away and we, we choose the wrong pass, but at the end we could have ended up winning see, three or four. There's something about muscle memory, again, because they just, as soon as Arsenal's players realise that we've got this, we've got it, it isn't happening. And I don't know if it was your confidence or the quality throughout the team, or whether it was you, you were younger, fitter, whatever, mm -hmm. as a group. Mm -hmm. There is a moment, and there was a moment where I could tell that I didn't know who was going to score or how it was going to come, but you just knew. And up until that moment, you, you couldn't really see how it could be, like, I know, in all honesty. I think it's a trait as well that follows a select band of clubs. Many times they do it. Mm. Many times the Liverpool get that last minute. Celtic, Rangers, Manchester, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid. Munich. <laughs> Is it, it attitude? It's just that never ever surrendering or saying you're beat. Yeah. At no point you just don't know what's going to happen. And sometimes and we'd that'll... been beat. Honestly, we'd been. It was a yeah. proper beating Arsenal. It was, I, a, it was a proper. I hope that wasn't lesson. exaggerating. That it was a massive doing. They were very good. Also, they were very good on the day. And to come out, they couldn't believe it. They were shell shocked. Do you still? Uh, it seems to shows what I know. You win three trophies. You go into Liverpool. You're an absolute legend. You're adored by the fans. We're going to talk about you going win a, a European trophy, but it still stings you bitterly that you didn't start whereas not starting and coming on and influencing the game is, is, yeah. a, is a glory of its own but it's... but at the time honestly I wanted to play in the FA Cup final because that was all the, the foreign boys all the European lads they hold the UEFA Cup in such high esteem they wanted to play in the UEFA Cup and that would have been my choice UEFA too I'm yeah. been, I don't know why but since I've been born Europe, Europe, Europe. yeah UEFA Cup you know and, and it was a, it's, it's a UEFA Cup when it was you know bearing in mind Porto yeah. Roma, yeah. Barca, yeah. you know, Alaves was the weakest team we played in the final. But before we let you back to the world and before we talk about Alaves even briefly, I need to say that, you know, I, I think you you might just be forgiven by Pep Guardiola now, but you broke that man. Because this, it's the semi final, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Barca draw Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And the second leg's at Anfield. Stevie's mate, Patrick Cliver, maybe. What was he doing? Yeah. I don't know. It was, it was a floaty corner. Mm up towards the back post area. Looked as if Clivert was favourite to win it. And then he goes up and leads by his hand. I think he thought he was going to take one from behind and he, for some reason he swings his arm and it's a, it's a stonewall penalty. Penalty. And, uh, you know, a little bit of shenanigans before the penalty. Is there any doubt about who takes it? No, Is it no. absolutely clear? Nailed on, I've got the ball, yeah. There's nobody coming in, I'm, I've got the ball. So as I go to place the ball, Puyol is ranting a wee bit on, in Spanish, which I have no idea, but he's, it's, no, it's obviously no nice what he's saying. So, marks the card a wee bit there. And again, I go, I go high up to the keeper's left, probably higher than I wanted to go. You know, that <laughs> little moment where your heart flutters and it's like, oh, you do <laughs> That's where I meant to put it. I know, right in the postage it went. <laughs> so it's maybe two feet lower than that that I'm looking at, but it, it goes up into that area. My first instinct is just to turn and look for Puyol. I give him a wee bit of Scottish straight back in and sort of 
swing a clenched fist, you know, of bang, you're out, we've done it, it's late in the game. I think I catch Stevie. As I follow through, I catch Stevie comes to <laughs> jump on me and I, I clip him a wee bit on the side of the head. But Puyol was, he was looking for me, he was he, trying all sorts before it. You see, you weren't, and Stevie does the same to Pep at the end, there's a brilliant picture, I don't know if we've talked about it before, there's a brilliant picture, Pep's trudging off, looking disconsolate, because he knows that's his last European game, because he's announced he's leaving. I think he half thinks he's going to Old Trafford. And then Steve, Steve, just, gee, just presumably an exuberance, shaven head, you know, suede head. Mm -hmm. He's running up there and looking youthful and young as well. But he's, there's a picture catches Pep downcast, not even looking, as Stevie G is an inch away from him, bawling at him, the whistle's gone. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant. Play. It's football's version of Ali over. Right you know, in his, it's, it's right, right in his face. They, take that. But you and Pep were, were similar as footballers. Because he played systematically, mm -hmm. really systematically, maybe not identical, but similar um, skills and similar knowledge of what the ball was for and, and an understanding of how to pull strings either of opponents or fellow players. I guess it was all about winning and you didn't know that he was last game for, in Europe and all that stuff. But any memories of actually what playing against Pep was like? Did, did he stand out or was he just another obstacle? Or, oh, there, there, in fact, there, in fact. All right. Wow. It's lovely, it's lovely pitch, isn't it? No, you did the, the, my, you know, my feeling with Pep, it's, he was a real continuity player. Yeah. You know what, I think he could play in any company. He's one of those players that could receive and take. Not necessarily hurting you with passes, or, you know, but I don't think it broke, it never broke down. It never broke down at all. A guy that, you know, the knowledge of the game and receiving, knowing where the opponent was, all the little things that you need to know, and you can see, that knowledge being passed on to the, to the ones that followed. Chavin and knowing Chavin. where they are and knowing where they turn. Always turn it to the safe side. Playing the ball to the safe side of your part of your mm. midfield partner, away from the defender. Weight of pass. All the all the little things that you associate with class acts. Have you enjoyed watching his team's brilliant football? Oh, he, he can't not. You know, as much as I know, there'll be people saying that they pass for the sake. They know they pass. No, breathtaking to this day still. What do you imagine is going to happen in England as, as, as a result of Pep's style of playing, talking, thinking, teaching, changing? He's got maximum respect here. You know, I think that's the thing. I think he'll get that from the terraces as well. Mm. But I think, just like a lot of the guys that come in, I think there'll be a quick realisation, and no disrespect in the Bundesliga and uh, in La Liga, there's gimmies in both those leagues. There's no gimmies here. You know, you'll find going to... Norwich, who might be in the bottom, or you know, whoever's in the bottom three or four, wherever they play them, whether it's at, at the Etihad, it's going to be hard work every 90 minutes. They're not going to be the, the fives and the sixes, which he's probably got used to over the, the last, what, five, six, seven years. You know, Bayern are capable all the time. And they, they have force fives now. The number of force fives at, at Barca was. For me, I, you know, watching those games, you, you know, it was. The acceptance of the opposition, that won't happen. You'll realise that doesn't happen here. They don't go under. I don't think teams go under it's as easy. It's interesting. It's fascinating. I think, in that case, maybe it's going to be a shock for him. Because I, think I, Jürgen's, I think Jürgen's fine in that. I, think he, I, I don't accepted. know if he can... The, the intensity, he just... Like, how do these guys... How, how are Palace get these players? How, are, how have... You know, how do you know what you've put your finger on? The first interview I ever did with Rafa Benitez was at Valencia. Probably in... 2002 or three, and it, he, he wasn't much for interviews then but he, he granted one it was at Paterno training in Valencia and he told this anecdote about I think it's now commonly known maybe it's commonly known because I, I wrote it and it came out in the UEFA page a decade and a bit ago God, um, that he got in touch with Steve McLaren he'd gone to work at the cliff I think before Carrington to study Alec Ferguson working and he admitted that what he bugged Steve McLaren over and over and over and over about was, how do you get your players to be so hungry and aggressive and never give up and never say die? And what do you teach them? And how do you? And Steve McLaren, who maybe isn't archetypically yeah. like that himself because he's a thinker yeah, and yeah. he's a he's a quick mm -hmm. likes to change. He went, it's in our blood. That's in the blood. That's the way we yeah, are. The, some Is that the, true? Some of the foreign lads they really can't come to terms mm -hmm. with how intense and how determined British players are every day. You know, on a five-a-side on a Tuesday. 
they're like, what are you doing? Mm. They, they don't get the, the, how much they want to win a little six aside across the pitch. And the, and the good ones come and buy into it and, and, they, and they enjoy playing here, but they, they don't. I don't think that happens in other countries, that, that real desire to win a 4v4. See, Pep was like that. Pep was like that every day, mm -hmm. is like that. I was warned very early when I was getting a bit angelic about Pep when he took over, and I was like, oh, be very... And players who'd played against him said, Aye, hold on a second. He'd stab on your toe, he'd put his finger Aye. in your ear, he'd well, kill your parents, everything. And, and it was win. to win, no. to win, to win, to win. No, so but his intensity, I understand what you're saying a slightly different thing, because the, it's not the intensity he's going to bring, mm -hmm. it's the intensity he's going to be hit with, about the routine, the travel, the incessant demands, the, yeah. the way in which no team rolls over. What I want to discover, mm -hmm. talking out of side my I'm talking to an expert now, but what I want to discover is whether Pep's going to instill exactly that same it's type of ferocity and intensity in a group of players who are expensively put together and are exceptionally talented. And I wonder if maybe the, the effect might go the other way, and that's the beauty of finding out. Well, I don't know the well, answer. You know, you would, you would... I look at his CV and I go... Why Man City and no Man United? Yeah, you're on ground that I get a lot of grief about. And then let's, let's just know. share. I, I know from having spoken to him about his first meeting with Alex Ferguson when he thought he was going to sign mm -hmm. as a player and how bitterly disappointed he was about not going there. And I know from having spoken to people who have worked with him, who are going to work with him again, that his passion for history and tradition mm -hmm. and, and pressure mm -hmm. and ghosts looking down on yeah. his shoulder and pushing him on made him for years and until relatively recently. In my private schedule, mm -hmm. if I could tick my boxes, mm -hmm. it would be United. And not City, although he's close friends with Jicky Bagheristan. Yeah, yeah. And there's and a good the respect for the fan and the sorry. But I'm when City didn't get him, when he left his sojourn in New York, they thought they had him and they were irate mm -hmm. that he went to Bayern Munich. And if you want my honest opinion, mm -hmm. what has happened is City kept on working very, very, very yeah. hard, and United went to sleep. And they've they've come off the mark, yeah. That's why I think that's no surprise because I, I, you know you look at the people who are now the movers and shakers at United. And I don't know. It if has changed. You know, if David Gill had been there, it might have been different. I think it would have been massively different. Um, yeah. That's my opinion, and I'm not being mm -hmm. deliberately mean about think, it. But I think how will affect the players, and the, I think he'll find it immediately, and he'll be skillful enough to go. I think all the players will want to go with them, but they might be players who can't do it. Yes. I, I don't think he can call them and say, well, you're inept. He might just not be able to go with that intensity the way he wants, and he'll have to be given time to recruit. I think it's going to be a choppy time, and I think that I, my appreciation is that within the football community, although I disagree with those people, and certainly within the media, there are people waiting to say, hey, look, you see, he's it's not, not that easy, all yeah. that. It's easy in Germany, it's easy in Spain. <laughs> yeah, and we always said that, and I see people, I saw them in 2008, they were a rabble in 2008. Mm -hmm. Your mate Puyol was the only one who cared anymore. Frank Reichardt said, I'm embarrassed about what state I left that club in in 2008. And Puyol was almost in tears trying to rally yeah. everybody. Yeah. So when Pep came in and they now say, ah, oh, he took over out, they were in a there was shambles. Yeah. And exactly. it changed things. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll let you go on a golden, golden, golden memory, unless there's, unless there's things about Leicester and Coventry we have to see. Because I, I guess... Alibis is still... Has there been a better night for you in football than that? No, I don't think so. You know, been, I think I was involved in all the goals, scored a goal. We touched on it earlier. I was given man of the match and presented by Johan Cruyff. It doesn't get much better than that, does it? I kind of do it, on it? That That's was a sort of little Britain like, wrote was, the theme tune, sang the theme it tune. It was like, it was just one of those nights. Heck of a stadium too. I've got to say, we go 1-0, we go 2-0, I think we're winning 5 or 6. Yeah. And then the one little thing, you know, Gerard really was brilliant to me. This was maybe one of the reasons why we didn't quite just get the win in the league at Liverpool, because the following season we were unlucky second to Arsenal. At 2 0, information comes on Gary, DD, stay behind it, Stevie. Let's, let's protect what we've got. Rather than being having that cavalier, if you're going to win a league, you've got to, at some point, you know, you, you go. Go and win five, go and win six. What he knew best was what to protect what he had. We were cruising. And then Alaves make a couple of brave substitutions. Mm -hmm. They're in it, they're back in mm -hmm. it, and it turned. Mm -hmm. We are rocking. And Robbie Fowler comes on and gets a goal, and, and the. 
this is a wee bit left field, but one of one of the memories that I have of, of the game that night is just as Robbie's warming up to come on, I'm taking an, a corner. So Westfall Stadion, obviously, you know the yellow wall. It's fantastic, isn't it? Alaves have got that. Yeah. And then Liverpool have got the other three quarters of the ground. So I'm in the Liverpool end of the so it's all Liverpool fans. And I'm just about to try and hit a little corner to Emil Heskett in the post. And Robbie's stretching his hamstrings, getting ready to come on. Short run up, just try to dink it to the near post. And something comes flying out the stand, you know, from high, and it comes whizzing past my ear, and I'm thinking, boom. It comes whizzing past Robbie, past me, and thuds into the deck. You know, and obviously it's a very memorable night, but this is one of the things that sticks in my mind from the night. And on closer inspection, <laughs> Fowler and I look at it, and we go, yeah, it is. And it was the biggest double dildo <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. And, and as cool as you like, Fowler, Fowler flicks it up with his right peg no. and volleyed it back into the crowd. <laughs> and, it's like, that's, and I'm thinking, that's, you know, and you think back, and that's one of the things, like, oh yeah. Fowler. Who makes that plan? You, you, you're at your house and you're like, scarf, yeah, ticket, yeah, passport, yeah. Double, double, do, double, double. <laughs> Who, who's, all right, lads, where is it? it was, who's left it behind? Wow, it was like, wow. Thank the Lord it didn't hit. So, but, but, but great night. And, and to this, <laughs> I never knew that. And you know, the, the, you know, the golden goal to this day, if you, if you get a wee chance to ever see that ball hitting off the head and get into the back post, four or five year boys go back to the, they the centre. Know. They don't know. You knew, eh? I knew. Yeah. But, um, if I'm thinking back, Sammy Hippier, Marcus Ballo, Didi, they're, they're going back, ready to wow. see you at the game. I hope the celebration is there was a wee bit of punishment for, uh, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's a hard school of knocks in the dressing room, and if you go back to the centre circle, there's got to be some... By the way, we were ushered back into the change room with a wee bit of photographs and that taken, and then we were straight on an airplane heading to the valley to beat Charlton in the last game of the season to secure Champions League. So the, the, the way she... It was nothing after the game. And a celebration of several days later is good, but it's not quite that... It was a good trip back from the valley. I would say. say. But the euphoria, that mad euphoria. Yeah, it couldn't do it. We were, were literally... We had a massive, probably a bigger game, as far as... It's the, the, the you know, that, pragmatic revenue. We're try to, you know, trying to attract players. You've got to win the Champions League. And this was the... We had to win the game at, at the valley. The Golden Golden Night, um, I say it over and over again, but it's deadly sincere. This, this is a massive privilege. Pleasure. Brilliant. Thank I you very that. much indeed. Yeah. I knew it would be good fun. Good. I, a legend good talking about football. No, it's, it's, it's what I like then. I, I don't know anything else. <laughs> <laughs>
But also, thank you, big thank you to Scott Mackay, to Harry De Cosimo, who I know, Ben Harshaw, Scott and Ben, if I know you too, sorry, but I've worked with Harry. To the three of you, you're getting a shout out because you invested in the shout out when Kickstarter was on. Scott Mackay, Harry De Cosmo, Ben Harshaw, your support is typical of the well over a thousand people who donated money to make sure the big interview carried on. I hope we've given you the type of words, the type of memories, the type of images from football people that you wanted when you backed us in Kickstarter. The editing, as always, is by Alex Ady at Audio Boom. And our theme music is by Beer Jacket, who, by this time tomorrow, if you're listening on the first day, please don't write in otherwise. If you're listening on the first day tomorrow night in Glasgow at the second fiesta, Beer Jacket will be playing live. You beauty. The big interview is produced by Backpage and me, Graham Hunter. There's more about all of us at my website, grahamhunter.tv, where you can join the mailing list and get everything sent to you immediately that it comes out, blogs and interviews. You can also send us in questions for future interviews. We will listen to them and we will incorporate them, I promise you. And like I said, please help us reach new listeners by reviewing the show on iTunes or wherever it is you get it and listen to it. And tell the football people in your life about the big interview. Just don't tell them about that thing on the pitch when Gary played Alaves. It's a bit naughty. Love you.